Good morning. Wonderful to be up here before you with something to share. Uh, it is, uh, this morning especially, I, I appreciate so much what Jim helped us uh, with this morning, getting, getting us you know, able to set aside the distractions, able to focus, you know. Um, as soon as he started that, uh, little Tavon came in and, you know, crawled across the pew, thump, 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 thump. I was like, okay, focus, focus. <laughs> Jim wasn't even done talking yet, and I had a distraction, you know, and these poor folks in front of us, same thing. Uh, but it is true. We've got we to decide to focus. We've got to decide to be devoted at this moment, to not multitask. I love that, right? Devotion is what we're going to be talking about today. And it is what we're all about. You know, that, that the songs we sang, my goodness, some of those songs, you know, the, what's the one with the fetter, right? Uh, Come thou fount of every blessing, right? I mean, we, we basically said, let your goodness, like a fetter, like something, like chains, like a binding, bind my wandering heart to thee. I don't want to wander anymore. Keep me from wandering. Keep me close to you, not by your discipline, but by your goodness, which, of course, can come, you know, discipline can come because God's good to us going to mention that later, by the way. Uh, but it is God's goodness. It is his amazing blessing in our lives. It is the true motivator, the one that gets us moving. Uh, this sermon series is about Jesus. So I am, I, it, there's, a, there's a certain lightness in your step when you know you're going to be sharing a story about the actual, you know, Savior, our, our, our the Lord, the one we came here because we follow him every day. So be, before we begin that lesson, let's go to the Father in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you that you gave us examples of the kind of disciple you want us to be in your word. You show us people who, with their whole hearts, followed you, were open to you, listened to you, gave precious things to you. And we ask, Father, that you would help our hearts to be in the same mode. Help us to honor you, help us to love you, help us to offer to you what we can from our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This sermon series uh, I've called Seven Days Before the Cross. Interesting factoid, I did almost the same thing two years ago, and I had forgotten that. It wasn't exactly called this, but it, was, it looked at you know, the last week of Jesus' life. And then I went back, and Jim Fields taught a class in 2012 all about the last week of Jesus' life. And in 2010, we did an entire church-wide class and sermon combination about like the last week of Jesus' life. So, you guys should know what we're talking about, right? Should be familiar territory. But really, there's so much here. You, there's almost no overlap because of all that you could talk about, all that is happening in that last week. It's so crucial, so important. And it's even difficult sometimes to piece it all together. The, the thing we're going to look at today happened either on Friday or Saturday, uh, of the week before his crucifixion. I'm going to start in uh, the end of chapter 11 of the Gospel of John, and then I'm going to sort of use John and Mark together. You'll see uh, when we move into John chapter 12 and Mark chapter 14. Let's take a look here. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. So the context for the last week of Jesus being in Jerusalem is a very specific context, and that is Passover. Passover was massive. Passover was huge. And the crowds would come to Jerusalem. They would, like this photo shows, you know, people would just come in droves. They would come in caravans. You wouldn't come by yourself. You, you, you really wouldn't want to travel those roads by yourself. But you would go in these caravans. You would go with a whole, you know, group of families. Kind of like if this whole congregation decided to walk, you know, somewhere and go somewhere together. That's what it would be like. And they would come to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, if this is Jerusalem's normal population, this is the population of Jerusalem every uh, day, you know, normal size. During Passover, that's how many people were in Jerusalem. Now, I don't include numbers because 
I could not find definitive numbers on what they think the population of Jerusalem was. But no matter, it was interesting because a lot of people talk about normally Jerusalem's this, during Passover it's this. And there were different numbers, different historians all over the place, including Josephus, all over the place. But you know one thing that was the common thing? They all said population tripled during Passover. So whatever it was, whether it was 100,000, whether it was 200,000, triple that for the time of Passover. So there's tons and tons of people. And they come and they set up tents. They stay with relatives. It's, you know, it, it's almost like, um, I don't want to say Woodstock because that has a bad connotation, you know. But, you know, think of these huge events where people are setting up tents and they're, you know, just sort of makeshift. And, and everybody has a sheep. Everybody has a lamb. Every single family. So it's not just the people, but it's the man, man of all these sheep that they're going to be taking to the, it would be pandemonium. And you could see why trying to find one guy, even a famous and popular guy like Jesus was, it would be tough to find Jesus among this massive crowd. So Jesus comes also to Jerusalem, but he doesn't stay in Jerusalem, at least at the beginning. He goes to a nearby spot. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. So as, as I said, Jesus doesn't go to Jerusalem per se yet, but he goes to Bethany. Now, how close was that? How, how far away? What are we talking about? Um, as I looked at it, if we were to walk to Stanford, all right, so st from Stanford to here was how close Bethany was. I mean, it's kind of like the same neighborhood. It's really uh, on the other side of the Mount of Olives. It's very, very close. Uh, about a half hour walk. I, for me, it would take a lot longer. For some of you, it would be a lot shorter. Uh, Samuel and Brian could get there in about 10 minutes, all right, so. Uh, or, or Andrew with his, you know, running, right, Andrew? But that's how, it's, it's very close. So it's, it's not like they, you know, he's not, he's gone to a far off town. It's very, very close. Uh, but he goes to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And if you were reading the Gospel of John, you would have remembered just the chapter before. This is the Lazarus. He, as he says, he raised him from the dead. He had died. Now, the first mention of Mary and Martha, Jesus visits them. And Mary listens, remember, while Martha is serving. She's doing the, the household serving. That's in Luke chapter 10. And Martha says to Jesus, aren't you going to tell her to come help me? And, you know, Jesus says, I'm not going to take this away from her. The second mention is the chapter before, the death and then the rising of Lazarus. An amazing moment. Uh, it is not a, a resurrection per se. It's more of a resuscitation. It's bringing his actual body back to life. We're not going to go into the details of that. But resurrection is going to be important in a few weeks here as we get to Jesus, right? But Lazarus has been brought back to life, and he's there reclining at the table. And then, of course, this is the third mention, this visit before Passover. So he's come to the house, and it says they're friends. You know, he, it, the, these folks are his friends. And he treats the disciples like friends. And these guys are disciples, but they don't seem to be following Jesus around. But it's like their house is always open for Jesus and the twelve to come and stay with them whenever they're in town. And so they arrive. So since Lazarus has just been raised from the dead, that, keep that in mind as we move into this next moment. Because how would you feel? What if it was your brother and he died? He was dead three days in the tomb. And they come and Jesus calls him out of the tomb and they take the burial garments off of him. And he's with you again. And he's back and he's sitting around the table with you. That's the person that's now coming to your house. Mary, the one who in Luke chapter 10 was the, right at the feet of Jesus listening, she decides to do something special. Mary, therefore, I love that therefore, right? Jesus comes, this, he's there with Lazarus, so of course, Mary, therefore, does something here. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, I believe this same moment is what's being described in Mark chapter 14 
It just has no names, right? So it has, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment and of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. So if we combine all the details, we have Mary who comes with this alabaster jar, this alabaster flask, and she comes to Jesus and she breaks it and she anoints his feet, according to John, and his head, according to Mark. She wants to make sure this goes to Jesus. And it's very costly. We're about to find out how costly it is because somebody's going to talk about it. But it is 300 denarii. One denarius is a day's wages for a laborer. Okay? So 300 denarii is about a year's wages. That's how much, how precious it was. This thing she poured out, pulled out of the closet, broke out of the cupboard, brought over and broke and placed on Jesus, anointing his feet, anointing his hair and his head. Now, what was this? Why did she have this? Most commentators look at this and say, this seems like or looks like what in the financial world is called a nest egg. Do you ever hear that term from finances, right? Many of you have that very much on your minds right now. If you retire and you have something, this is how they define it. A substantial sum of money or other assets that have been saved or invested for a specific purpose. Such assets are generally earmarked for longer term objectives. The term can also refer to money kept aside as a reserve to deal with unexpected emergencies. Your nest egg is that solid thing, that, that thing that you hold in reserve, the thing that's going to get me through my twilight years, the thing that's going to get me through any emergency that comes up, I have this as a security. And commentators are saying, that sounds like what she brought out. To give an illustration, the, the film Summersby that came out in the early 90s, there's a town and their crops are failing, things are not going well, cotton is not working out. And they had this idea, we should start planting tobacco and see how that goes for us. The whole town's going to do it. And so they say, well, how are we going to afford seed? We can't just invent cash that we have. And one of the guys from the town says, look, I know everybody is sitting on a little something. You got something that you could turn into cash. We could buy this seed and get things going. And the main character, Jodie Foster's character, uh, says this, well... I got a ruby brooch worth a thousand dollars. It's been in my family for a hundred years, but I can't eat it and neither can my family. So she takes her brooch and other people take their nest egg, their little thing they've been sitting on and they turn it into cash and it saves the town. They start to prosper again. That, that is what Mary brings to Jesus. Mary anoints Jesus as an act of devotion, gratitude, humility, and sacrifice. Sacrifice. Because she thought, Jesus is coming to my house. What can I offer? What can I do for him? Well, I have, I have this, this most precious thing, the thing that I could, I, I could sell and then be you know, okay for a good long time. This is my, my nest egg. This thing I'm sitting on, I, I'm going to give that to him. He deserves it. So she brings it out in total devotion, total gratitude. That's why I chose the theme scripture, because her attitude is exactly what the writer of Hebrews is calling us to have in our attitude. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. That's her at this moment. She is so overwhelmed with gratitude, what he has done for me, what he has shown us, and now I've, what do I have? I'm going to offer that that one thing, the most valuable thing I have, I'm giving it to him. That's Mary, and that's Mary's heart. I wish that was the end of the story. Don't you? 
I wish it just ended there and we move on to the next wonderful thing that Jesus does before the crucifixion, right? As he moves through Jerusalem. That's not the end of this scene, okay? Because, uh, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Now let's go to Mark to find out it wasn't just Judas. Okay? There were some, plural, who said to themselves, plural, indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. Not just like ice water, right? I don't even like to read it. Pouring that cold water over a beautiful moment. Judas and others see Jesus, see Mary's act as a waste worthy of scolding. And the show, the, the musical, Jesus Christ Superstar, gets it really right. I mean, this whole scene is done pretty well in that, and this is, this is Judas. Woman, your fine ointment, brand new and expensive, should have been saved for the poor. Why has it been wasted? We could have raised maybe 300 silver pieces or more. People who are hungry, and this is where he's addressing it to Jesus. People who are hungry, people who are starving, matter more than your feet and hair. That's Judas' attitude, and not just Judas. That's the attitude of some who are watching this scene, this beautiful moment because they can't wrap their head around why somebody would do this a few years ago eight years ago in fact a friend of mine was talking about this scene in the musical and we were talking about it back and forth and this friend of mine you could call him secular you could call him anti-religious he's mostly anti-christianity okay he, his take on it was interesting because this is what he said about Judas' statement. That always struck me as a reasonable objection. I blurred out his face and his name. That always struck me as a reasonable objection. Of course it sounds reasonable to you. You don't believe this guy's anything special. It wasn't your brother he brought back from death. Same for Judas, same for the other apostles who are ready to scold this woman. It's not you who has been changed completely in the heart because of this man. So I'm not surprised that you would think it would be much more practical and more beneficial to more people if we were to sell this, get the funds, and distribute it to the poor. Wouldn't that be better? What happens here in this kind of attitude is what Isaiah talked about Isaiah says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, I have heard this passage before, and I've talked about it, and others that I've heard have talked about it really in terms of calling bad good. That's the main focus when we look at it, right? Oh, you know, you should never get sucked in to what society thinks is okay, right? Because it's sin. But folks, it's both. There are times when we can have such a bad attitude, we can have such a bad reaction, that we're calling good bad. That's what Judas is doing here. Judas is trying to criticize this as a waste when it was a pure act of devotion. It was good. And that is why Jesus defends Mary and dignifies her display of devotion. Mark chapter 14, but Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, 
What she has done will be told in memory of her. And so we tell it today. Jesus defends the dignity, the beauty of this act of pure devotion on Mary's part. Leave her alone. Don't you dare scold her. It reminds me of when they were trying to push the children away from Jesus. He says, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop what you're doing. Don't push them away. Let the children come to me. Let Mary do exactly what she wants because what she's doing is already pointing to my death. It may be that Mary, of all the disciples, was the only one listening. All those times when he kept saying, you know, I'm about to go die. I'm about to go die. I'm going to go die at the hands of the Gentiles. I'm, I'm going to be dying soon. And they say, wow, I really wonder what he means when he's talking about dying. Mary says, maybe he's going to die. Maybe we need to do something now to show our love and devotion to him. So what about for us when we look at the comparison, Mary's reaction, Judas' reaction? Well, first of all, for us, number one, the beauty of devotion will be seen in more than words. Mary does not speak here. She also doesn't speak in Luke chapter 10 when Martha is saying, Jesus, why aren't you scolding my sister? She's scolded in John chapter 12 and Mark chapter 14, but she never speaks. She offers this devotion, not with words, not just saying, oh, Jesus, I really think you're great, but showing Jesus how great he is to her by this act of gratitude, this act of sacrifice. Most of the time, words are just so much easier. Again, Isaiah, and the Lord said, this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. That's not Mary. Mary's not just somebody who acknowledges Jesus with her lips. She acknowledges Jesus with what is truly most precious to her in her life. Gives it to him. Gives it to him in a risky, wasteful way to just try to get that devotion across. That should be our attitude as well. Number two, God's approval is the only concern when it comes to devotion. That's all we really need to worry about. What does God think? Too often, when we have an idea or we have a way that we're going to go and we're going to serve on God's behalf or in Jesus' name, we start to think, yeah, but, I mean, what's everybody going to think? You know what? Will it catch on? Will, will it be something that everybody's going to say was a good job? And Mary says, that just doesn't matter. Devotion to God. All that matters in that case is God's approval. If it's what he wants, then it should be what we're about. Number three, acts of devotion carry the risk of meeting scorn. This is the sad reality, not just in Jesus' time, but in our time as well. Uh, let me give you an example. The cathedral in Strasbourg, it's currently, it's currently in France. It's sometimes in France and sometimes it's in Germany depending on whether the Germans really want that territory or not. I think it's in France now, but it's very German France. It's both, right? Uh, the detail on this cathedral, I mean, I know, you know. For me, when I look at these old cathedrals, these old churches, um, I understand that they were, the church was not in the right place, right? They were, they were heading off into strange areas, but the people who carved and chiseled and prepared these works of art, I believe were showing devotion to God. And when people see the cathedral at Strasbourg, they say, this is devotion. I mean, there's intricate, intricate statues and, and carvings of Jesus' life and the life of the apostles. There's the stonework is amazing. The, the stained glass window, incredible. But I guarantee you, there are people who, a few blocks away, as they are approaching the Cathedral of Strasbourg, notice something. Do you notice something? Did you forget something, folks? Originally, the plan was to have two bell towers, and they never got around to building the second. So I can imagine somebody walking saying, I've heard the amazing Cathedral of Strasbourg. Are you kidding me? Why didn't they just finish it? 
And can you imagine the person who painstakingly looked at every detail and they said, oh, but look at what we've done. It's beautiful. It's incredible. Let me know when you finish it. All right. They're actually still working on a cathedral in Barcelona. They still have more to do there. But you can see, you can picture somebody saying that and throwing cold water on somebody else's devotion easily. Sometimes it happens and you don't even think of it. Acts of devotion carry the risk of meeting scorn. Who would ever do that? I would. I have. Long time ago, Mike? Yesterday. Let me explain. I have a short story to tell you. Okay? It's kind of a testimony. All right? It's one of those confessional moments. All right? I need to tell you this story. I am obligated to tell you this story. You'll know by the end why. Uh, yesterday morning, well, okay, some of you who don't know, maybe some of you online haven't noticed, but we are foster parents, so we take care of a little guy, and he's three years old. Lately, he's decided that normal sleeping hours are kind of optional, right, and not pleasant, doesn't want to sleep at those hours, and so wakes up all hours of the night. Um, I try to help with that, but he's crying for Shauna, so what can I do, right? <laughs> Uh, literally, it is difficult sometimes because I'll go in and the screaming only gets louder because that's not the person he was asking for. And so that person he is asking for, the lovely Shauna, has to make her way in. Well, okay, yesterday morning, it was 5.45 a.m. That's 5.45 on a Saturday morning, okay, which feels so much earlier than a weekday morning at 5.45, doesn't it? Because you feel like you've been promised something Saturday morning. When 545 comes and there's, the cry is there, or recently the running into your room, which is a new development, uh, that happened. And I did my best, I did my best, but it was Shauna who had to take him in. And Shauna who took him and, and rocked him and tried to get him back to sleep. I guess she did. I laid there and I was furious. And I was, I was sulking. Right? I was literally sulking. If you, can, if you look up the dictionary definition of sulking, that was my face yesterday morning. Oh, I can't stand this. God, this is infuriating. Finally, by, I don't know, 6.30, 7 o'clock, I make my way downstairs. Because I realized my sulking wasn't being seen by anybody. <laughs> Everybody was missing some of my best faces and, and grunts of, of displeasure. So I came downstairs to sulk. And I, I started blasting. This is, this is not any kind of way to live. This is misery. This is not sustainable. I try to persuade people for a living. And that's what I was trying to do. I was using rhetorical techniques, everything I could, hyperbole, right? To, we can't live like this. Now, my lovely wife, who was the one, by the way, who got out of bed, could have said, Oh, you're the one who can't live this way? But she did not. She nodded her head and said, yes, this is difficult. This is difficult. This is tough. So I sulk my way to the computer where I open things up and I start working on today's sermon. And I'm moving along and I'm moving along and I'm typing brilliant things and it's all wonderful and great. And then I come to number four that I type. And number four says, discouraging heartfelt acts of devotion puts you with Judas, not Jesus. And I, I looked up from my computer, and it was as if the Holy Spirit literally smacked me across the face. And I think he kind of did. In a loving, chiding kind of way, the Lord loves the, you know, disciplines those he loves. I was getting it across the face, folks. He must really love me. Because I missed it. I was literally discouraging an act of devotion. I was standing in the place of Judas. Shauna wants me to say, because I told her I was going to talk about this. She wants me to say, she's had her struggles too, right? Like twice <laughs> compared to my daily struggles. But that's the thing. And why would that ever happen, right? Let's take a different context, right? Let's say somebody's doing work here in the church. Why would somebody ever discourage 
a heartfelt act of devotion, there can be all kinds of reasons. Maybe you feel like you should be doing more. And so you look at them and you say, uh, uh, don't bother, right? Let's, let's not even worry about that. You're wasting your time. It's a waste of time. You're literally saying words that Judas said. And so we got to watch ourselves. Discouraging somebody. First Thessalonians, it simply says, do not quench the spirit. And who knows what Paul meant there, but I think he had this in mind. That we can throw cold water on what the Spirit has done in somebody else's heart. As they're out there serving, as they're out there working. And for whatever reason, we decide we're going to be the practical ones. We're going to, be the re we're going to make a reasonable argument against what they're doing and seeing it as wasteful or as superfluous. Don't quench the Spirit. So, of course, I had to tell that story. I'm, I'm obligated because the spirit moved, smacked me across the face. So let's not stand in the place of Judas. Let's stand in the place of Mary. And I want you to imagine, as the last point here, imagine a church full of disciples like Mary. Full of disciples ready to respond in gratitude, ready to respond with an act of devotion. What can I bring? The old devotional book that many of you have probably read or looked at was called My Utmost for his highest, my utmost. What can I give? What can I bring? What do I have? What am I sitting on? What's in my cupboard that I can bring out for him? And maybe for some of you, it's actually your, your time that's very precious to you. And some of you, I have seen you give your time to him in service to this body. And I appreciate it. We could use an entire church full of women like Mary, disciples like Mary, who are simply and riskingly, you know, going out there in, in spite of potential scorn, having the right attitude and simply saying, I'm going to give him my all. I'm going to give him my best. That's our lesson this morning. If you today need to respond to a God who says, I want you and I want your whole heart. I don't want part of you I don't want you just on Sundays. I want you to give your all to me because he gave his all. This whole sermon series is leading us to that moment where Jesus offers himself for us, makes it possible for us to not walk a sin life anymore, but have that, that replaced and rejuvenated and transformed into a new life where we walk in confidence with God. If you need to respond to him, then come as we stand and sing.